Hello, everyone. My name is Anna Gjma Abusa. I am the director of the Weiser Center for Emerging Democracies, and it is my great pleasure and honor today to welcome Karen Dewisha, who is a distinguished expert on Russian and Soviet politics. Mm -hmm. Professor Dewisha is the Walter Havikhurst Professor of Political Science at Miami University and the director of the Havikhurst Center for Russian and Post-Soviet Studies. She's the author of numerous articles and has written ten, eight books, which have examined the consolidation of democracy in East Central and Southeast Europe, the, the post-Soviet politics of Central Asia, the possibilities of, of, for democracy in post-Soviet Russia, and the international dimension of regime <coughs> collapse and rebuilding. <coughs> Most recently, she's the author of Putin's Kleptocracy, a meticulously documented and researched study of the financial and political nexus that festers in Russia and the ways in which it has benefited Putin and his coterie. The book has been widely lauded for exposing the greed and corruption that surrounds Putin's regime. And so we are truly honored to welcome Professor Dabisha today as she speaks on Putin's kleptocracy, who owns Russia. Thanks, Anna. Well, I have to say that your invitation for me to come this week was really inspired. <laughs> So I am going to give a lecture on the basics of Putin's kleptocracy, but I will try to leave uh, some time at the end to talk specifically about the Panama Papers and what we might find in them if and when we get full access to um, these documents. So in, in my own uh, analysis, this is this is what I def this is how I define a kleptocracy. What is a kleptocracy? Uh, let me start out by saying that in 2013, Google had less than a hundred hits on the term kleptocracy. About a month ago, in other words, long before the <laughs> Panama Papers, kleptocracy had already over a hundred thousand hits. And about half of them were for Putin's kleptocracy. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a subject worth studying seriously. I don't, I don't mean to, did not intend to um, use this as a term of you know, moral judgment. But I do think that I, it has a, a specific meaning. And in my own mind, a kleptocracy is a system in which the risk is nationalized while the reward is privatized. The risk is nationalized and the reward is privatized. Let's take a theoretical example. Imagine you are a cellist in Russia and you want to invest money and you create a series of companies, one of them with the theoretical name of Sandalwood. And that company is, is uh, uh, set up by a company in Panama and is registered uh, in the British Virgin Islands. Into this box is poured cash. And this cash is coming from a state-supported bank in Cyprus called the Russian Commercial Bank, which is a subsidiary of uh, a main Russian state bank in charge of all foreign, Russian state foreign trade. They put into Sandalwood for this cellist about two billion dollars. And they put it by loaning him money. They loaned money to a company called Sandalwood which was not secured by any uh, collateral. They loaned money from a state bank, any bank. I mean, would any of us go into any bank in the United States, uh, unless we were very lucky and very connected, uh, and come out with $100,000 that didn't have our house or our parents' house behind it? Absolutely impossible. Impossible. You have to have collateral behind all loans. These were unsecured loans to a company. And that is exactly what that is, from a state bank. The risk is nationalized. All of the risk of loaning a cellist all this money is taken on by the state very specifically in the form of unsecured loans. 
There's all other kinds of ways you could define this. And the reward to this cellist, if it really was for the cellist, is privatized. So that's a very specific example of the definition of kleptocracy. And who gets into this system? I'm not talking about everybody in Russia. I guarantee you there are lots of people right now in Moscow who are young professionals who took out mortgages, which are not only highly secured, but must be paid in foreign currency, dollar mortgages. So when you have the collapse of the ruble, the people who gave, gave these folks mortgages have no risk. They bear no risk for these uh, mortgages. So only those loyal to Putin benefit from this rule. And those, uh, they follow these rules which, in which property rights are secured by loyalty and not by law. So you have um, nominal, well, it's a, a, not nominal. You have uh, ownership of a company in Russia. You are fated abroad. You're given uh, awards by the Kennan Institute for your global citizenship. Uh, you put on the board of Guggenheim uh, because you are the, a big person in spare bank. You are supposed to be the one who owns something. But do you really in Russia? Do you really own that? So here you have a system in which loyalty is the loyalty to Putin, loyalty to the system, is critical for allowing you to exercise what in other systems would look like property rights. But it's very clear from a large number of cases that they don't actually have these property rights. So when you have, um, for example, an, uh, 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 oligarchs were asked by Putin to bring their money home to be patriots. And you have several of them saying, well, we support the state, we support Putin. It's because of Putin that we made what we make, so of course we support the state. Now that's very patriotic, and I can imagine that there would be many American uh, multimillionaires, billionaires, who would make the same kind of statements. However, at the end of the day, if they don't sign their property over to the U.S. government. All of that is just PR. In Russia, this is a real situation. So that uh, after making these statements about de-offshoreization, Putin at the um, annual New Year's Eve party for his loyalists told the, the following story. This is, this is, he told this to his supporters. So the situation with property in Russia is very complex. But all of you who are here, who are great supporters of the Russian state, know that it's a bit like uh, property rights in, in Russia are a bit like chicken and an egg. The chicken sits on the egg and thinks it owns the egg. But at the end of the day, we can put our hands in and take the egg. And the chicken doesn't really own that egg. He said this to his loyalists on New Year's Eve, in New Year's Eve 19, uh, 2014, after the imposition of sanctions. So he himself uh, is, is implementing this system that property rights are secured by loyalty and not by law. Market is highly distorted. As a result, the, the normal laws of the market that you would expect to see of why it is, how it is that a company might company might fail or succeed don't apply in Russia. So Gazprom is uh, the state gas uh, company uh, according to all measures of um, price per share and so forth is highly successful. But if it were Exxon it would be five times more successful based on the fundamentals. So there is a huge drag on the success of Gazprom because of the use of Gazprom funds for lots of political projects, including the building of, of um, Sochi Olympic buildings and so forth. 
the forthcoming building of all the of many of the um, stadia for the World Cup. Nobody's objecting, by the way, to corporate sponsorship of sports events because it's highly important here too. The difference is that they don't have a choice and they are actually building with funds that are from a company that is publicly traded on the New York Stock Exchange. In other words, our funds, your pension funds, my, Havikurst, Havikurst um, uh, Center has a very large endowment and I keep telling <laughs> the people who are investing it, that they really shouldn't be investing in Gazprom. <laughs> but they say, it's a, it, of the emerging market stocks, it's one of the most reliable. It is. But, you know, if they chose to do something with it tomorrow, they could. So it's, it's not operating according to anything like true market principles. Of course, there's no transparency. Uh, tribute is extracted. Tribute. What do we mean by tribute in this case? In, uh, after Maidan in Ukraine, when uh, the young people went into Yanukovych's house, they found the house and its contents, which included a solid gold loaf of bread. Now, we know that loaves of bread are very magical in Slavic culture, but there are very few cases where this loaf of bread needs to be turned into solid gold. You know, bread and salt would be sufficient <laughs> if you wanted to express your appreciation for Yanukovych coming somewhere. So here you have a tribute system uh, similar to the one that existed, for example, under Saddam Hussein. And we have other examples. For example, there is a very rich Jordanian <coughs> oligarch who has Russian citizenship and does a lot of building for various projects, and he gets a lot of oil and gas pipeline uh, contracts. And one of the things he built was a massive palace in the hope that Putin would occupy it. So we're not talking here about turning up with, you know, a nice box of lint chocolate. We're talking here about projects for Putin that are sometimes desired by him, but often, I think, not necessarily. It simply is part of the process of showing that you are loyal. And loyalty is expected, and there's definitely lots of cases that we know of where uh, if silence isn't provided about how the system operates, people are, are, are killed. So the principle of omerta is a absolutely operating at the top leadership of the, Put of the Putin hierarchy. And we have lots, several cases of people who've left Russia, turned up in London, um, and who've given interviews, provided documents, and so forth. And of course, sometimes they're living fine, but sometimes they're not. And their expectation is that if they leave and if they talk, then they will be subject to the ultimate sacrifice. So who cares about this? Well, Boris Nimtsov uh, cared. For, for anyone who might not know, Nimtsov had been deputy prime minister. He was no mere um, member of the opposition. He was highly talented, highly expert, and very dogged in his uh, research into the details of corruption in the Putin regime. He, he, he you can see him delivering, announcing his latest, his last, actually, his penultimate uh, report, which was on the Winter Olympics in the subtropics, and um, which gave a lot of details about the real cost of the Olympics. The number of 50 billion is accepted by everyone. It was a Nimsov number. It was the research that he did on the contracts and the kickbacks uh, that produced this number. And the paperback edition of my own book, uh, I dedicated to him. So who else cares? Well, the US and the EU care a lot about um, the nature of this system. 
and they care even more now that the Panama Papers have been released. But in uh, spring of 2014, after you, so you have the Sochi Olympics, then you have the uh, forcible annexation, the illegal annexation of Crimea, and then sanctions were imposed. In this same time, my book was getting ready to be published, and I obviously had no idea that these sanctions were coming down the line. I was extremely pleased. And I obviously, obviously had talked to lots of people in the U.S. government and the British government about their analysis of what was going on in Russia. They were, in fact, very helpful, especially people who had served in the consulates in, in St. Petersburg in the 90s. Um, they were very helpful. Um, but I didn't have any idea that these sanctions were coming down. And when they said these sanctions by name listed the group of people around a senior Russian government official and justified the imposition of sanctions on the basis that they had been bankers to this person, that they had provided financing for Crimea, that they had been involved in all kinds of other business op uh, Taking, taking advantage of lots of business opportunities. This was the basis for these um, sanctions. Well, you only need to type in hashtag Russia or hashtag Russia Trump or hashtag Russia Tr Clinton to, to see lots of uh, t tweets about uh, the next president is going to have to do something about Russia. It's going to have to start relations with Russia absolutely from, from the beginning because Obama has, has ruined everything, right? And uh, there's a very similar and even more robust uh, discussion of this in Europe where you have many countries, I would say mainly what Rumsfeld called old Europe, very interested in maintaining relations with, with Russia, and even today the, um, in Denmark, the referendum for including Ukraine in uh, negotiations for EU accession was roundly defeated. Uh, that was certainly helped by support from Russia, by encouragement from pro-Russian political elites and journalists there. So we have a, a, a real issue in Europe and a real divide, more or less, between elites in the <coughs> post-Soviet states and elites in old Europe. So this impact on the, the impact of this kleptocracy on the West is significant. And let me just say that um, I could go into a lot more detail on this, and I actually have written a whole article on this subject that's coming out in Perspectives of Politics this summer. But let me just sum up this part of this argument, and then we'll move on. And that is this, that everyone hoped that in Russia, democratization and the rule of law would take root because over time, Emerging elites, whether you want to call them robber barons or whatever, uh, became more and more concerned about risk. That in the cowboy West, the rewards were very high, but the risk was also very high. And so over time, rewards, as land became parceled, uh, businesses became taken, whether in the Wild West or in Russia, the, the argument is the risk would decline, the, the rewards would decline, and therefore the desire of the elites to decrease their risk would also emerge, and that's when they would become interested in law. Law would be written by the elites as a way of avoiding violence, basically. And this didn't happen really in Russia. <laughs> and why is that? My argument is that it's a, as a result of globalization. The borders of the world are now very different than they were in 19th century America. 
And what has happened instead is that the elites in Russia, the oligarchs in Russia, have been able to minimize risk through agreements with the regime. And they were able also, as with the agreement of the regime, which was with the elites, the top elites, who were doing exactly the same thing, to stabilize their rewards by taking it out of the country, taking their money out, and benefiting from our rule of law. They didn't need to have rule of law there. And in fact, rule of law reduces rewards. You can't have everything. You can't, you have to pay taxes. Theor I know this is, has become a very theoretical construct, but theoretically you have to pay taxes. You have to obey the laws. There's, you can't just do whatever you want. But in Russia, what's happened is that instead of gaining an interest in introducing laws, they opened up to the world and they took their money out. So they got the benefit of our rule of law. And so here's an interesting uh, little thing. That these are uh, all Central Bank of Russia figures, which means they're extremely conservative. They, they, they're, they don't include suitcases and, and precious metals. So 2005 to 2013, capital flight as a, toll, as a whole, was $330 billion, which is already a huge sum. 2014, sanctions are introduced, and Putin says to the elites, you must bring your money home. Deoffshoreization is what we need. In one year alone, officially, elites took $150 billion out. One year. So this shows you the short-term thinking of this elite. And clearly from the Panama Papers, this el these elites include the very highest elites. What happens in terms of the West? As we've seen from the Panama Papers, Russian laundered money and Chinese laundered money, all laundered money, contributes massively to black economies in the West. Massively. So if we calculate looking at the sums that have just been mentioned uh, in Panama Papers and in the articles about it, pro approximately one half of all daily flows of dollars in the world are into and around the black economy. In other words, not being tracked, not paying taxes. Approximately half. And of course, it strengthens these tax havens and weakens sovereign control. So when I'm driving up here from Ohio, southern Ohio, to Michigan, and I see all the potholes and all the, you know, late beginnings to road repair and all of that, um, why is that? Because no jurisdiction is collecting enough taxes. So it it's absolutely affects us. This, this absence of tax collection. And that's not just, you know, the fact that full professors at Michigan clearly are not paying enough taxes, but, or anywhere for that matter. Um, no, we're paying. It's fine. Nobody, for, nobody panic. Um, but it's only us, only people who are receiving salaries who are paying taxes. Anybody who goes out into the private world and sets up a business has a far more beneficial situation. So I just noticed today I was signing the tax form so that I can get paid the honorarium for this lecture. And it wants my name. And then it wants who I am as an entity for the purposes of tax. Am I an individual? And then there's about seven or eight other things I could have picked, like an LLC. Am I a Corporation S? Am I? This is what happens when. <laughs> K Street gets involved in lobbying for uh, our, our tax code. We are left paying something pretty standard, and businesses, if they're paying tax at all, are paying very, very little relative to the profits that they are uh, making. So let's return back to Russia. 
This is a, a uh, diagram. Uh, this is just a, a small snapshot. The, 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 the actual diagram is huge. So down here are some of the people who are sanctioned. And, some of, and here you have their connection with Putin. And here's what they own. And here is what Forbes r reckons their net worth is. So here you have someone who's in charge of the largest state shipbuilding corporation, and 10 others, including mainly uh, defense industries. He was actually with uh, Putin in Dresden. Kovalchuk, a member of the original Ozero cooperative, Bank Russia, and its, all of its subsidiaries, which are at the center of Panama Papers. 1.4 billion. Arkady Rottenberg, judo partner with Putin, owns all of these, and this is his net worth. Tim Chinka, um, I put St. Petersburg, but I know that that's, that's I'll, I'll tell you the story in a second. Uh, St. Petersburg, nobody wants to talk about this. And these are all of his companies, and this is his net worth. So you can see who's the largest. If there's an asterisk, they, they or their companies, or both, have been subject to sanctions, which means that any transaction in dollars, any transactions in dollars anywhere in the world is subject to sanctions because legally any transaction in dollars goes through the United States. That's the, that's the position. So they can no longer do, uh, you know, any oil shipment. This is Gunvor's oil shipment, oil shipment, uh, Saha Trans oil shipment, Stroy Transgas oil. They can't do any shipment and give se and sell anything to a Western company that wants to do any business with the United States. Sanctions are a very powerful tool. Very powerful tool. And we will find, I'm sure, when we get access to the 11.2 million documents, lots of these companies. And the Department of Treasury and the Department of Justice, the uh, people who, who deal in this have already announced they are going to start going through these documents to see who has broken sanctions. And they, as we've seen with Iran sanctions, with the sanctions on Iraq, these people, if they're American citizens, will go to prison. The U.S. government does not mess around. And what's interesting, that's a big difference between the U.S. and the EU, is that the U.S. government sanctions are imposed and sanctions are lifted as a, by administrative fiat. They are not subject to approval by law. They are not subject to congressional approval, which is why Donald Trump can talk about the 150 uh, billion that is going back to Iran. Well, that's Iranian money that we took. We, ke we kept it in safe keeping for Iran all these years. The great thing about American sanctions is you have a company, you have one of these LLCs, right? You have a company, it then you get put on the sanctions list and you go in with your debit card <laughs> your credit card or you get your nominee director to, to go and withdraw, the money's just gone. You don't get an email. You don't get notification. You don't know where it went, and you're not going to ask Putin because he probably doesn't know that you had it in the first place. So now we've got this huge fun hunt of whose money is going to be taken, where is it, um, and we know a lot of this money has quietly now gone into, into the sanctions. I will say, uh, Temchenka it is under sanction as a person. Gunvor, which he owned with another person uh, from Sweden, was transferred 100% to the, 
to the Swedish individual one day before the sanctions were announced, suggesting that somebody knew and somebody told the Russians. So at least he was able to get this one company out. Now why I say I put St. Petersburg there, there's a story about this, which I heard in the UK when I was doing interviews, which is not in my book. And that is, people have always asked, where did Putin and Timchenko meet? And Timchenko was always saying, oh, we didn't know each other, we're just business acquaintances, he helped me in Petersburg, blah, 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 blah. Well, he certainly helped him in Petersburg. The company that, that Putin, that Timchenko formed, was the very first contract approved by Putin for the export of oil. It's contract number one. His first day, he signed off on this. You cannot tell me. No one in, no one in their right mind would believe that he didn't know who Temchenko was. And the story is that they're both KGB, and they are good friends, and that they were arrested together in Finland in uh, 1990, so before the collapse of the Soviet Union. I mean, how, they were arrested for drunken disorderly by the Finns. Now, how drunk do you have to be to get arrested for drunken disorderly in Finland? <laughs> I mean, it's almost impossible to imagine what they were up to. So because of the old rules of Finlandization, one of the rules, uh, agreements they had was that if any Russian citizen is arrested, that arrest will be reported to the Soviet embassy. And indeed, the names of Putin and Timchika were put into the blotter in the embassy. What the Soviets didn't know is that the Blondinka, who was working for the embassy, was also working for MI6. And she is living somewhere in the UK. So I put St. Petersburg there, but I think that all evidence suggests that they go very far back. Here's an actual, like a screenshot of what the um, OFAC web, website looks like in Treasury. So this is Department of Treasury, Office of Foreign Assets Control. And they are very, they are working lots of overtime this week in this office. They've already announced that they're going after a second round of people. And this is Temchinka, the $15 billion this guy is worth. And he's got an entry on OFAC which looks like a criminal charge sheet. He, I mean, he must be so proud, right? <laughs> so you can see his AKAs, you know, it's like uh, some rapper. His different uh, uh, places of birth, dates of birth, you can see they're not quite sure. Um, same year as Putin, 9th of November, 52, places of birth. Could be here, could be here. Nationality Finland, nationality Russian, alternative nationality Armenia. So a collector of passports. Someone like all the top people in the Putin uh, crony system, they have escape means. They have EU passports. They, they, can, they can get to Europe if they need to. Um, this is a, taken a little while ago from Financial Times, a great, great graphic. You can just see who they are. We've already <coughs> talked about <coughs> the Rottenbergs and the Kovalchuks. <coughs> Some of the people here who are not under sanction, but um, very close to Putin. Other associates, Set, um, Sergei Ivanov is now head of the presidential administration. Viktor Ivanov, very much named in the Litvinenko inquiry as being both the person who is in charge of drug control in Russia, the drug czar, and is the number one dealer in drugs. Uh, Narishkin, another Silovic power minister. Yakunin is has reemerged as somebody in the Panama Papers, and he uh, he announced his retirement last year. It's a very unusual story. 
there were some stories about him, his son and his grandson living in London, in Highgate, North London, and it was thought that this might be the, re the reason, but there could equally be another reason that he actually is the head of the kind of orthodox Siloviki group. He's very popular amongst the, the far right in Russia and has, it before now, certainly is not uh, uncorrupt, but has talked a lot about the need to clean up corruption. So if you need to get rid of him, you just charge him with corruption. And here's Temchenko again. So this is a, a core group around, around Putin. Well, why should we care? This inequality in Russia is simply staggering. You know, it's bad in the United States. It's gotten worse in the United States to the extent that we have something, you know, we had something called Occupy and basically has been the basis of Bernie Sanders' campaign. It's important in the United States. Take, take the 300,000 millionaires in the United States and put them into 110 billionaires in Russia. The gap between the ultra-rich and the, the well-off is doesn't almost does not exist in Russia whereas you're talking about the ultra rich and then an emerging middle class with some and not a small number but uh, so, nothing like the United States small and medium sized business owners who do not have property protection one of the biggest problems now in Russia in terms of social uh, sensitivity is the number of middle managers, not middle, middle, medium-sized owners, business owners, who are raided by people on the top. There are no property rights. And these guys on the top, they have protection. So if they want somebody's business, they just go take it. And they, they put them in jail through the use of law. You know, the, the, the idea being that for my friends, anything for my enemies, the law. So you have approximately 300,000 medium-sized business owners who are now sitting in prison as a result of their businesses being raided by people who are above them who have political protection. And let's see, do I? So I want to bring in the Nigeria case because it really is, to me, quite shocking, not because I think no one should be compared with Nigeria. But if you look at um, corruption scores, all the different data sets that we can look, Transparency International and so forth, Nigeria scores now better than Russia as a country that's trying to tackle uh, corruption. It is, they are both equally bad, they're right there at the bottom, in terms of per perception of corruption. But what is really disgusting is when you look at human development index numbers. Russia is a country with a highly developed population. Nigeria is a country with a very low levels of development in terms of edu education, knowledge, uh, all the things that we associate with human development, which means that if you're going to do what they've done in Russia, you have to suppress this group because they know what you're doing. They're not ignorant. It's not being stolen, you know, in the middle of the night and they don't know what happened to it, like in the lowest of the, of the underdeveloped countries. So you need to depend upon repression. And repression, in, not just in terms of beating people over the head and sending them to gulag, but what is a modern-day repression? Ele eliminating the public space. Russians don't have right to a public space. So when we see what happened in Finland at the beginning of the week with about one in three Finns coming and demonstrating, and in Russia, three people turned up at the door of the Duma and all three got arrested. They don't have the right to a public space. They don't have free, free media. They don't have civil society. And yet these are people unbelievably capable of building these structures. They don't have a gulag, but they have something that is, is much cheaper, emigration. 
The door is open. You don't like it? Go. So last year, 400,000 people with higher education left Russia. Officially, officially, according to Russian, Russia's own data, this isn't, oh, I'm going for an extended holiday in Spain, I'm not coming back. So they emigrated. They took their skills and they went, well, as many as could get into the United States certainly would come here, but there are many countries in Western Europe that are, are receiving them, but they're going everywhere. So Thailand is a, is a, a major destination. Visa-free sta uh, travel status with Israel still exists. So if you can get papers that say you're Jewish, which is not that difficult in Russia, you can also now go freely to Israel. So this inequality is not just a matter of statistics. It's a matter of real people who are really suffering. And um, doc, uh, uh, data published last week suggests that 19% of the Russian population now lives in po poverty. 19% lives in poverty. OK, so what's your definition of poverty? in the United States. What's the definition of poverty? Because we also have a huge problem with poverty. In Russia, it's $137 a month. Well, average income has got a lot of very rich people's numbers in it. <laughs> uh, median income is about Fourteen hundred dollars, median. But that was about three or four years ago. So I'm not going to go back to how it all began. You can see pictures of Putin. Uh, I will show you a couple of pictures of this guy, <coughs> Zolotov. So Putin's personal bodyguard since the 1990s has been a guy called Viktor Zolotov. Viktor Zolotov set up this company, Baltic Escort, with another guy. This is that guy's funeral. <laughs> and he was assigned, he was already a general in the KGB. He was assigned to guard Subchak and Putin. Two days ago, Viktor Zolotov, who has been Putin's uh, presidential bodyguard for 14 years until t 2014 was announced as the head of the new National Guard in Russia with uh, 400,000 people are going to be part of this National Guard which in will include the special forces and they are they're going to introduce a law they named him first shows you the state of parliamentary they named him first, said he's going to be the head of the National Guard. He will report directly to Putin, not to the Ministry of Interior, not to the FSB. And they will, he will be, his troops will be given the authority to shoot without warning. Inside Russia. This isn't an external force. So here you have someone who ran the black cash, cash for Putin's uh, kickbacks from gambling in, in St. Petersburg in the 1990s, now in charge of the Praetorian Guard to protect Putin's rule personally. Here he is. Um, Panama Papers. I'm just going to say a couple of words about this. So the, the big stories in the Panama Papers, did I put the... Um, and I definitely suggest you go and look at this website because they are rolling out a new story every day for 14 days. And then at the beginning of May, they say they're going to put up all the documents. So it'll be digitally uh, um, searchable. So panamapapers.icij.org. Um, what we see there are Putin's childhood friends. We see Kovalchuk. We see Bank Russia. Kovalchuk is the, the, the lead owner of Bank Russia. And we see also not just the uh, businessmen who are around Putin, but we see his security ministers 
who are also taking money out. So we see uh, Patrushev and Chemezov. Chemezov was with Putin in Dresden. Patrushev was with Putin in St. Peters, Pe Petersburg. And they have been in charge of major security ministries since the beginning of the Putin era. So this Panama Papers has a lot of implications for the West in terms of who's enabling this kind of gram theft, what impact it's going to have on on, uh, on the United States, on Western Europe, on these um, tax havens, since Panama ranks only number 13 in terms of the size of the, in terms of the number of businesses that are registered offshore. Only number 13. And for Russian money, it's still Switzerland. So when Navalny Po posted a tweet yesterday and asked for s one person from Switzerland to be brave. I think it's, to me, it's like the number one conclusion that we should reach. We're going to learn about the scheme, how this money moves, how it moves out of Russia, who's moving it, how the Putin system works. We're also, sadly for us, going to learn who are the lawyers, who are the bankers, who are the lobbyists, where how is law established? What's the role of the, of, of, of the UK in the establishment of all of these things? How many lords, uh, they say at least five, are na going to be named with offshore accounts? Will David Cameron survive? Will the president of, of fin is the president of Finland, has he resigned or did he actually, oh, I'm sorry, of Iceland, did he resign or did he take it back? Prime Minister. So, I read just as I was coming in here that he's announced that he may not need to leave. And so there's a huge crisis there. And we're going to learn some very uncomfortable things about how the international system works in practice. We also are seeing that in, these, in this very account, Mosek Fonseca, the, the company that was hacked, the German emigrant father, the, the, the owner of Mossack. His father was a was a SS, Waffen SS officer, um, living obviously extremely well there. And we're going to learn a lot about what's what is really the nasty underside. And I'll I'll just stop on on with one question, maybe to the students. I don't know if the faculty will even have the faintest idea. So I gave a talk last year at MIT. And uh, like today, I went in, in search of the bookstore. I had a little more luck at MIT, I have to say. <laughs> and in the uh, lobby of the co-op bookstore at MIT is an ATM. What kind of ATM do you think it was? Huh? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Do you have a Bitcoin ATM here? And I was absolutely fascinated by this. And I s stood just outside the lobby and watched for about an hour and a half. It was being used very frequently by very smart, it looked like, young uh, computer science or other kinds of s students at uh, MIT. And we can do a lot of things with this Panama Papers, but one thing that, that I think we mustn't do, and that is to close off uh, the international financial uh, world to SWIFT account. There's going to be a lot of discussion of SWIFT. So when we, when we write a check, there's our account number, and then there's a SWIFT number, right? And all of this money that's moving all over the world is primarily going, well, all the money we know about is primarily going through SWIFT. And so as sanctions increase, a lot of people are saying, why don't we just take Russia off of SWIFT? They have so many alternatives. And one of the alternatives is that they can use Silk Road. They can use uh, the alternative to SWIFT. 
one of which is Bitcoin, and they can strengthen at, the, at a stroke all the, the, the security of the black economy and absolutely weaken sovereign states' control of, of financial flows. At the moment, I would assume, of course I have no idea of this, that we are capable of looking into SWIFT with our security services. I assume that, because otherwise, how do we know when somebody has just taken $103 million out of, out of Russia into a Swiss bank account? There must be a SWIFT transaction that we're monitoring, I'm assuming. Well, if we <laughs> take Russia out of SWIFT, do we have a plan? Do we know what we're going to do? So I think far better to attack these offshore, uh, offshore accounts. They still, Russia, Russian elites will still want the rule of law in the West. They will still want it. And so cutting them off from that will be, I think, a huge mistake and very harmful to our economies too. Thanks. Do you want me to take questions? So, Could you introduce yourselves for, for me? The state grows fat and the people grow lean. It's a Russian proverb, right? And the people who are responsible for the loss of income and prosperity in Russia are Russian elites. We didn't do this to them. You know, we didn't do this to them. They took, I mean, for God's sake, and I know you agree with me, but one cellist, one cellist took two billion out? How much are the people who actually know what they're doing taking? So, you know, R Russia in the mid-2000s just started making all of this money. And it took all of the constraints off of the elite. Everybody just grabbed what they could. And the middle class did better at that time, right? <coughs> Lots of people bought <coughs> homes. Uh, everyone had their foreign vacation in Europe, maybe once or twice a year. I mean. Most of my Russian friends were constantly posting on Facebook a p lovely pictures from the south of France or from, from Chamonix or wherever. That is indeed uh, beyond many of their means now. And it's, it is, yes, a, a partially a result of sanctions, but this theft started long before the sanctions. And clearly, um, when you... Um, do a collection amongst the oligarchs so that you can buy Putin a $50 million yacht, which is what occurred uh, in 1999, when $50 million was something. Well, that's money that's not going into, the, into investment in other, in other areas. When, when uh, Putin got more interested in uh, what, what was called Project Yug, the, the palace in Galenjik, then the building of health uh, clinics, those clinics that were not built as a result of, of money that was allocated from the health budget, that affected this group. And, his, and, then, and then there was a whistleblower, and so even poor Putin didn't get to enjoy his palace. So we're talking here about uh, not, not just, oh, Russia's always been corrupt corruption. Uh, even Brezhnev liked his cars. 
No, we're talking something beyond that. We're talking about, at a minimum, 27 palaces. 27 palaces with a full-time permanent staff so that he can visit them whenever he wishes. Right? We're talking about a fleet of private airplanes that are available to him at any moment to go anywhere. Um, we're talking about you know, a lifestyle that would allow him to have you know, one of the, the, the in the circle, actually I'll show you, revealed in the, this is the Guardian website, which is really great on, on this. Um, In the, cir in the circle of businesses, it's not, it's not the exact graphic I was going to show. In the circle of businesses that shows where it starts with Kovalchuk and Roldugin and then goes abroad to, to Panama and then goes to British Virgin Islands, and then some of it comes back to Russia. What did they, what did they in this case, what did they build in Russia? They built a private ski slope an hour north of St. Petersburg where Putin had the wedding for his daughter that is owned by his son-in-law from the other daughter. So even when they bring money back in, because you know, I think that's going to be something to really look at in these documents, how much of this money came back in? Maybe it's not so stupid to do this, right? Because if you have a company called Sandalwood and you get a $200 million loan, and from that you earn $8 million given to you in interest by BVI, why not keep it? Why not get that $8 million, right? It's not stupid. Um, but it should come back for investing in schools and roads and health clinics and all of that. And there's really no evidence that any of it was going back for these kinds of purposes. It was going back to fuel the lifestyle of those who are now sanctioned. So I agree with you that, they, that middle class has really declined. They're in very bad straits, but that is the, the fault of the elite. So I guess I was struck by both your slide about the offshoreization not exactly working and the Praetorian guy at guard. How do these guys behave as they start to come under more economic pressure from the sanctions? What happens to the power structure that they're in? They become paranoid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I personally think that the establishment of a National Guard is a symptom, a symptom of paranoia. Russia doesn't have the money to, to be occupying 400,000 people in this way. This is a huge line on the budget. And one can only imagine that uh, there would be bureaucratic and personal objections to the establishment of this National Guard since Zolotov was promoted to be Deputy Minister of Interior in 2014, and they had been talking about doing something like this since then within the Ministry of Interior. And now it's moved completely out of that, and he's got his own thing. So one can imagine that the Ministry of Interior now, stripped of a large percentage of its internal police, is going to be not very happy about this, and that the, the FSB, the successor to the KGB, is also not going to be very happy. Uh, so I, I think that there, is, there are signs that the Putin circle is closing. The access that people used to have to him is, is, is decreasing. Um, his most loyal group still has access to him, but he's not uh, making himself available in the same way that, that he used to be. That's my own take on it. I have uh, two questions. And the first one is minor, but I'm just curious about it. You mentioned something about uh, when the U.S. blocks money uh, of due to sanctions of other countries, uh, such as Iran, for example, they, uh, they give it back. Mm -hmm. Do they give it back with interest? Yes. They do give it back. Okay. Uh, my second question is, and I have a little comment about it. I, as long as I have lived, I've, my homeland has been a 
the homeland of my country. So my husband had become a crypto officer. Where, where is that? Turkey is his country and Iran is mine. Um, and his, in his case, they had, you know, it, it started after U.S. intervention or U.S. influence in their country. But leaving that aside, I think that the fact, that's a whole different debate as to when some countries, uh, you know, economic system is called kleptro or political system is called kleptocracy, and when it is not, it usually is double standard when it's not called kleptocracy and when it is. But that's a whole different debate and a comment. You, uh, the person who presented you, the lady who presented you, mentioned that you have done some work on uh, the potential for democracy in Russia when the, uh, the, war, the fall of the Soviet Union. So af uh, with hindsight, after looking at what's happening in the Middle East, with the fall of Saddam, with the fall of uh, uh, what's his name in Libya, uh, Hussein Mubarak in Egypt, all of these countries with their fall. How, and after seeing how the Russia was under Yeltsin, uh, or after Gorbachev. Um, what is the alternative to, to a Putin and a strong government? I understand that there's a lot of robbery uh, that comes with the strong power, uh, so strong control, centralized control, but what is the alternative? How would democracy, <coughs> or something like democracy be possible in a country like Russia when people don't have a democratic uh, education, in the sense that they haven't come to democracy naturally with economic development, and uh, a country so big, so vast. Uh, can you comment on that? Basically, I want to see what, how would democracy or something support democracy be possible? I'm not supporting well, Putin. No, 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 no. Uh, I have, in my country, I, I've been the victim of Putin. My book wasn't Putin's kleptocracy as an idea for the book did not was not the original idea of my book. So I wanted to explore why it was that elections in Russia, and I've done a lot of writing on elections, did not um, do what elections are supposed to do, which is to become more embedded rules and norms are supposed to become more embedded over time. They can be more problematic, but I mean, all of the electoral monitoring that the, the Western world does basically is based on the idea of why do we always give those new democracies a nice pat on the back and tell them to keep going? Because it sh they should get better. <laughs> That's the view. And it didn't in Russia. So I started to go back and I discovered that <coughs> Uh, there, there wasn't in the Putin period any of the elections that hadn't been stolen. In my view, including the 2000 election, was stolen. Uh, and not by accident that there was a plan and they implemented the plan. And I, go to, and I had documents and I went into that in great detail in the book. I think it's very difficult for nascent civil society, uh, and I don't care how well educated the population is in, you know, world literature, if they don't have actual experience of demanding their, their political rights, it becomes quite difficult to receive them. And when you have an institution like the KGB melting into its successor, the FSB, they sought from the very beginning to make sure that the system would be controlled by them, that it would be private economy but political control. They, they adored Pinochet. And they even toyed with the idea of inviting him to come to Russia. So when you have people like that who have five years head start, and they talk the language of democracy, and they have Western leaders who invite him to the White House and slap him on the back and talk how great they're doing, and see, you know, whether it's Yeltsin and Clinton, or Bush and Putin, you know? At least, at least, <laughs> Yeltsin never looked into, <laughs> to, uh, <laughs>
Clinton never looked into Yeltsin's eyes and saw his soul. At least we were spared that. Clinton never looked for anybody's soul, right? So, but we had a lot of help from Western governments, and they were not sufficiently aware. Now, they then repeated, perhaps you could say, the same mistakes in the Middle East. But, you know, at a different scale. But, you know, there still are, at least in the Middle East, you have more than an N of one. You have, you have in, in, in the post-communist case, lots of post-Soviet uh, post regimes that very quickly made the transition to political freedom and to economic reorientation to the West. The Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, <coughs> right? Um, Russia is, ne is, is, is a very different case because it never had, uh, there is no, no one alive in Russia who remembered any belonging to any other party except the Communist Party. That's not the case in Poland. I think you're Polish, right? It's not the case in, Polish, uh, in Poland. And, and Poland always had a Communist Party that played a sort of cat and mouse game with the Soviet Union. So they, they, they kept certain things alive. They could have been much harsher with the, with the church than they were. In Russia, they were serious with these institutions. They, they truly destroyed them. So when you have no institutions that can keep the idea of the nation, the true nation, alive, like the church did in Poland, um, or even song festivals did in the Baltic states, or language did in the Caucasus, then, then it's a much more complex uh, uh, situation. In the Middle East, I, I, I'm no specialist on the Middle East. I'm talking to somebody, seeing somebody who is. But you know, I, I would say Tunisia is doing better than other countries in the Middle East, perhaps because they had more of a history of inclusiveness during their revolution and following it. They had, women were always in the public space. Um, I think it doesn't help when 50% of the population is not allowed to be fully in the public space in any country, including in the Middle East. So I... It could be much worse. <laughs> it could be much worse. I, I actually believe that there are ultranationalists in Russia who, who hate corruption and who, 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 would, who would instill a, a, a Hitler-style regime. Absolutely, I believe that. So in, but in Russia, it can always be much worse. <sighs> was showing his mother around the palaces that he had access to, was showing her cars, and she took a look at all of them and said, you know, Leonid, tell me what will happen if there is a revolution? <laughs> and now the question I have, that was just a story related, related to, to the question the lady asked. The question I had is about privatization. Mm -hmm. How did it take place in Russia in the 90s, and, and how how that compares to what happened in, in Eastern Europe or in China? Well, in Eastern Europe, one big advantage that they had, and I'm no specialist on Poland, <coughs> but one big advantage Poland had was that they had uh, a truly critical mass of economists who had worked in Western international economic institutions. I mean, what is the value of a Balsarovich? What's the value, you know? Or what's the value of a Klaus? You could like or dislike him. But in terms of privatization in Czechoslovakia and then in Czech Republic, pretty important. Who did they have in Russia? I mean, I, I, I knew uh, Yegor Gaidar very well, and he stayed with me when he came to the States, and I went to see him in, in Russia. He, he was reading Milton Friedman under the covers. He didn't have any Western experience. He had this theoretical thing. And, and of course, that was promoted by Harvard, you know, bad advice. Now we know insider advice and so forth. Um, so the Russians did not have people who were trained and who were, who were regarded as loyal to Poland or 
the, the, the lawyers, the constitutional lawyers in Hungary, they had all been trained in, in Paris. So they came, and there are, there are documents of this. They came back when it was clear that there was going to have to be an election, and they said, well, we think that you, we, we would, you know, communists would benefit if we did this kind of PR, if we had single-member districts, if we had multi-member districts. In Russia, <laughs> you talk to the people who wrote the Constitution, they, had, they made a mistake. They thought that they had the German system. They didn't have the German system. There's no, there's no top up. I mean, this is the, the, first, the first iteration. They've had many systems since. But they don't, don't have people who actually have run clean elections anywhere. So what happens is that you get people in who um, were, were, were specialists in political technology, what they call political technology, in other words, how to win an election by any means, and they were very powerful and important. And they wrote all these, you know, workbooks on, you know, how to win elections, and they did training seminars funded by our money on elections. They were, they were, they were basically implementing Nixonian dirty tricks in Russia as a result of what they thought was, the, was, was Western advice. They didn't want to be Western. They wanted to win the election, right? So that's, you know, you just, and n all the Russians who were in Brighton Beach or were wherever they were in the United States, they weren't going to go back to Russia. Unlike, let's say, the Baltics, the, the people who were living in Chicago who went back to the Baltic states, the people who were living in D.C. who went back and worked for Central Bank in, in Poland. Where were the, where were the foreign Russians? There, there, there weren't any. And the ones who are in Silicon Valley and so forth, they're not going to go back to Russia now. Well, I mean, actually, it is a slight difference. The Khodorkovsky people are saying that they will go back if the regime collapses, but we'll see. <laughs> yes, he did. He did go back. That's a very, it's a really good example. Of, 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 of why, why things went so well in Russia, <laughs> Mark. Can you say a little bit about the about academic life in Russia? I mean, you've worked with a number of Russian academics, and it's always, you know, you've got the Russian academics, and they're typical or atypical, and you see the same thing over and over again. Is that what you're talking about? Well, let's talk about um, how universities run, first of all. Typically, universities run uh, in a very corrupt manner. Um, and I'm not talking about some small university in Podunk, Podunkov. Uh, I'm talking about Moscow and St. Petersburg. I, I've worked with academics, individuals, my whole life. I, I've been at Miami in charge of this big center for 15 years with a lot of money, and we've tried and tried and tried to get agreements with universities that would not be renegotiated constantly. They don't obey contracts. They don't understand them. They d well, they do understand them. They just don't feel bound by them, right? So you, send, you go over with a group of students. You arrive that what you contracted for is not delivered. It's not provided. It's renegotiated. The lectures you thought you were going to get are not given. The students, the number of student groups, you know, r levels of Russian that you had thought you were going to be given, and everybody's now put in one group. I mean, it never works out well. Um, as a result of which, I, I, does Michigan have its own program in Russia? See, nobody does. Nobody does. So everybody is, is you know, using um, intermediary organizations so that we don't have to deal directly because you just you can't win they're too they're too good the the russian students often have to pay for their grades their their qualifications are very subject to uh being forged and um a bit like problems with chinese students you don't ever know what you're going to get now if you want to know something about russia you have to Go to Russia. You should go to Russia. And there are lots of brilliant people and lots of 
people who are truly qualified. The problem is, is that like everything in Russia, like everything in Russia, they do it on their own. I mean, it's the most amazing culture where nobody expects an institution of any kind to do right by them. They depend on their friends, they depend on their family, they depend on their network. It's informal, it's through, through relatives, and um, they produce some of the most, well, economists, for example, now, very brilliant people. I mean, you know, there are not many people from other countries in the world that have uh, a joint appointment at Higher School of Economics and University of Chicago Department of Economics. So Sonin is a brilliant guy, and there's, there are many like him, but they are doing it on their own. Right. Right, but it is, you know, it's like, what's, <laughs> what's the difference between a totally naked woman in public and a and a woman with, with pasties and a, and <laughs> and a sling or something? One is legal, one's illegal. <laughs> so if Russia wants to say it's a democracy, it has to have some window dressing, and the Duma provides it. They do what they're told. They're paid very nicely for it. They get uh, immunity from prosecution so that the person who was surely the person who gave Litvinenko the poison that killed him in London is the number two on the list for the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia. So it provides a huge amount of benefits for the individuals. Sometimes their regions benefit. Sometimes their regions benefit. You know, like um, Abramovich, when he was the, the governor, now this is the governor position, of Chita, which is in far Siberia. Um, he never lived there, but he did build a highway between the airport and the city, and the city center. So it's a bit like, you know. The road to nowhere. Yeah, the road to nowhere, exactly, the bridge to nowhere. They do, they do sometimes provide, and if you're a, a local person and you want to do something in the capital, then you would want to know who those people are who represent you. And you might assist them in whatever project they're interested in in your, just like here, in your locality, and they might assist you in whatever project you're interested in in Moscow. So there, there, it is a focus for business. Um, but it's, it's quite rare to f to think of, in fact, I'm not coming up with what that would be. It's quite rare to think of a true debate with a lot of opposition. There was one vote against the annexation of Crimea. So certainly in this Putin uh, round since 2012, the Duma hasn't even, even been an important for legislation. And they can get three readings in one day and pass it in one day now. So I'm expecting to see the National Guard approved next week and signed. Incidental uh, conjectures uh, a couple days ago about you know be prepared there's going to come out this terrible news about, about what's happening here in Russia that the news is discrediting us. That whole inner Putin uh, is indeed shrinking, and uh, just I don't know, do you think it may be more than coincidence that uh, there's something that often is from the more ground shock? Yeah, you know there there's. There's a lot of different Putins, right? So there's the Putin, the person, and uh, and and the extent, and he physically embodies power. That's why we have Putin with the tiger, to Putin without the shirt. I mean, the physical embodiment. There's no ideology except Putin in that body. But there's also the collective Putin, and that's this larger group. 
And um, I, I think that the, the role and stat, stat, status and legitimacy of the collective Putin could be very much hurt by these revelations. Because, for example, Roald Dugan, the cellist, okay? It's like Gergiv, the conductor. Anybody who loves opera loves Gergiv by definition, right? But Gergiv is a bit like Roald Dugan. In this, and he may be really a lot like Roald Dugan in terms of money, as far as we know. He's like the honorary consulate of Russia in Luxembourg, uh, for Luxembourg in Russia, in St. Petersburg. He has the rights to diplomatic immunity. He has the rights to, because that's what happens with honorary consulates in Russia, unlike, say, in the United States. I'm sure there's a Polish consulate in, in Michigan who can do absolutely nothing for you, right? We have one in Ohio, can do nothing for you, probably give you some good potato vodka and that's it. Um, but in Russia, because it's this group that are state counselors, really, they, they've passed a law that allows them to have um, open customs. They can go through the customs without being searched, both ways, going out and coming in. They want to take a suitcase full of gold, they can take it out. They, they cannot be stopped. They have the blue migalki in the, in the car. Of course, a lot of people have those, including the Duma. Um, they, their, their house can be uh, licensed as a duty-free zone. I mean, they are very, they know what they want, right? And so if you have this kind of details and documents coming out, I think the collective Putin could be quite significantly hit. The, the latest uh, polls in Russia show that the perception people have of state involvement in corruption has really increased, but not Putin. Still not the individual. But state involvement in corruption, oh yeah, they're corrupt. So we'll see. Could could really increase. Peskov's wife is also named in the Panama Papers. So he's, you know, he's going to have even less legitimacy than he had before. So. <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you.